the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office released a video showing the moments leading up to a deputy being stabbed by a Florida woman in the late hours of March the 23rd of 2022. The incident began after 21-year-old Leah Michelle Day crashed her car down an embankment along South Indian River Drive in Fort Pierce. Patrol Deputy Cody Colangelo, who was in the area, rushed to the scene of the crash and found Day walking along the shoreline. The deputy's body camera showed him asking a woman what was going on, to which she replied, I don't know. Colangelo asked her to come up from the water. Day, who had her hands behind her back, started crying and said she didn't want to because she was scared. The deputy asked her to walk up the stairs, which she did. After a couple of steps, Day suddenly turned around and lunged at the deputy, stabbing him in the neck before running away. Colangelo fired his gun but missed. Colangelo held pressure on his neck wound and radioed for assistance. Responding deputies found Day nearby in waist-deep water and arrested her. According to a police affidavit, she appeared impaired by narcotics. The affidavit also stated that the suspect said she crashed her car and was scared of going to jail due to the fact that she didn't have car insurance. She was booked into jail on charges of attempted premeditated first-degree murder of an officer, causing property damage and driving with a suspended license. Colangelo had to undergo surgery for the damage to his carotid artery, after which he was released to continue his recovery at home. Number 14. Jadarius Rose Shocking body camera footage showed police in Circleville, Ohio, unleashing a dog on Jadarius Rose, mauling him even as another state trooper can be heard warning the others not to let the dog loose. The 23-year-old had driven an 18-wheeler through rural Ohio with a missing mud flap on July the 4th of 2023. Because of the aforementioned violation, the Ohio State Highway Patrol attempted to stop the semi-tractor trailer on US Route 35, which it didn't do right away. Consequently, state troopers pursued him and called for assistance from the Circleville Police Department. When Rose finally pulled over, state troopers and Circleville police officers surrounded him at a distance, with guns drawn out. He delayed getting out of the truck because he was reportedly in fear that the officers were trying to kill him. When he got out, he had his hands up. An officer ordered Rose to get on the ground or he was going to get bit. In the video, one state trooper was heard telling the canine handler, do not release the dog with his hands up. Nevertheless, the Belgian Malinois was set loose and it attacked the man. At that point, the state trooper was heard saying, get the dog off of him, while Rose was on his knees and appeared to be pulled down to the ground by the dog. The gruesome footage showed the victim screaming out in pain, begging for the officers to get the dog off him. When the dog was taken off of him, he'd already sustained multiple injuries. Rose was taken to a hospital for treatment and was ultimately booked into the Ross County Jail on a charge of failure to comply with an order or signal of a police officer. He was released after posting bond. A month later, the dog's police handler, identified as Officer Ryan Speakman, was fired. The Circleville Police Department stated that he was terminated for not meeting the department's standards and expectations. As of the latest updates, the charge against Rose was dropped. Number 13. Shepherd of the Devil Parents were awarded $275,000 after officers from Montgomery County, Maryland, held down their preschooler son who ran away from school, calling him a shepherd of the devil. The ordeal unfolded on January the 14th of 2020, when the boy got upset in his kindergarten class at the East Silver Spring Elementary School. As the boy got more distressed, he threw a clipboard at his classmate and his teacher and somehow managed to flee the school. Police were subsequently called to assist the institution. Officers Dion Holliday and Kevin Christman found the boy about one block from the school hiding by a car. A police body-worn camera captured Christman grabbing the boy's left arm and pulling him towards police vehicles, prompting the child to cry out, I don't want to go. The officer told him he couldn't make that decision for himself and brought him back to the school. 
where they were met by a school administrator. In the video, Christman was seen forcing the crying child onto a chair in the principal's office. Holiday then told the boy to shut up and shouted near the boy's face, I hope your mama let me beat you. When the mother, Shanta Grant, arrived, the child calmed down. While Grant was speaking with the administrator, Christman was seen pulling out his handcuffs and closing one of the loops around the child's right wrist, telling him the cuffs were for people who didn't know how to act. After Grant was told by her son about suffering nightmares that police would shoot and arrest him, she started to discover how her son was treated during the incident. She sued Montgomery County, the county's education board, and the two officers. Lawyers who represented Grant said that how the boy was treated was way past the line of emotional child abuse. After a lengthy investigation, the county paid the victim's family in a settlement. Chrisman and Holiday were suspended without pay for two and four weeks respectively. The officers defended themselves in their actions. Chrisman said he believed that his actions were appropriate at the time because the child seemed defiant. Holiday acknowledged she berated and screamed at the child and admitted she had done so because of how he was acting. Number 12. Jeffrey Allen Martin 38-year-old Florida man Jeffrey Allen Martin was killed after he wreaked havoc in a hospital parking lot in Jacksonville and shot an officer on the evening of April the 18th of 2023. Martin was initially reported after he was suspiciously seen in the Baptist Medical Center South's parking lot, circling around hospital security in his vehicle. An off-duty officer working at the hospital noticed him and called in other police officers for backup. Body cam footage showed the first responding officer approaching Martin, who rolled his window down. The officer ordered him to get out of the car, but instead he shouted, shoot it, while holding a handgun. The suspect drove up to the officer's car and fired shots through the passenger window before speeding off. Other officers arrived at the scene and tried to maneuver Martin's vehicle off to the side. Martin rammed into the front of another patrol car and came to a full stop as other officers blocked him on all sides with their vehicles. Five officers quickly surrounded Martin's wrecked car. Officers could be heard shouting at Martin to get out of the car, to which he replied screaming, No! Police held their fire as one of the officers, Taylor Smith, inched closer to Martin's passenger door. Shortly after, Martin fired his handgun, hitting Smith in the throat. The latter managed to return several rounds, and at this time, the other officers had opened fire as well. Martin died after being hit by a hail of bullets. His handgun was recovered from under his thigh, and an AK-47, along with three loaded magazines, were found in his vehicle. Smith was taken to a local hospital in critical condition, but was expected to recover. As of the latest updates, the shooting was still under investigation by the sheriff's office and state attorney's office. Number 11. Austin Thompson Shortly after 5 p.m. on October the 13th of 2022, North Carolina teen Austin Thompson shot and killed his older brother in their family home in Raleigh's Headingham neighborhood. After shooting his older brother, Austin took a shotgun and a handgun and left the house shooting another five people, four of whom didn't survive. Police were called to the scene after dispatchers received reports of multiple gunshots. Witnesses said they saw the teen dressed in camouflage and carrying firearms. Police arrived on scene to find a woman who'd been fatally shot in a driveway and another victim who'd been critically injured on the front porch of the same property. A police officer who lived in the area was found in his car with fatal gunshot wounds. He was about to go to work when he was shot, police later claimed. Two more victims were found shot on a nearby greenway. After a massive search that shut down much of the area, law enforcement located Austin in an outbuilding described as a barn-like structure, which was about two miles from where the first shots were fired. When officers approached the structure at around 6.45 p.m., Austin exchanged fire with them. Police body camera video showed gunshots ringing out from the structure, striking one officer in the knee. The shooter refused to surrender, and he was arrested hours later after a SWAT team breached the outbuilding. Austin was found injured from a single gunshot wound and taken to a nearby hospital in critical condition but eventually recovered. 
The following week, his parents released a statement saying they were overcome with grief and saw no warning signs that their son was capable of doing what he did. In August of 2023, a grand jury returned indictments against Austin for five counts of murder in the deaths of Officer Gabriel Torres, Mary Elizabeth Marshall, Nicole Connors, Susan Carnitz, and the suspect's brother, James. He was also facing two counts of attempted murder, two counts of assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill or inflict serious injury, and one count of assault with a firearm on a law enforcement officer. His father, Alan Thompson, was also charged with a misdemeanor offense of storing a firearm in a manner accessible to a minor. As of the latest updates, the Wake County District Attorney's Office announced in October of 2023 that the teen would be tried as an adult. What had caused Austin to go on a shooting rampage still remains unclear. Number 10. Leah Marie Baker Florida woman Charity Baker, whose daughter was fatally shot by Jacksonville police officers, joined demonstrators in a peaceful rally outside the Duval County Courthouse calling for police reform. Baker's daughter had been killed on April the 11th of 2020. On that day, an officer was dispatched to Gulf Fair Boulevard to investigate a dispute between Charity's daughter, Leah Marie Baker, and her roommate. The dispatcher's notes on the call stated that the disturbance was in reference to Leah's medications having been allegedly stolen by the roommate. When the responding officer knocked at the front door, Leah opened the door and immediately charged at the officer with a large kitchen knife. The officer was stabbed in the left arm and called for backup. The 29-year-old initially dropped the knife and was told to get on the ground. After being repeatedly given instructions to get on the ground, Leah refused to comply and grabbed the knife again. At that point, the officer shot her. After Leah was disarmed, several law enforcement officers arrived. Police body-worn footage revealed that the woman was attacked by a police dog, kicked in the face, and tased in the chest. In the video, one officer could be heard saying, be careful, her guts are falling out, as the dog dragged the woman into the street. The video of the shooting was later made public by the state attorney's office. After the incident, the officers involved were investigated and subsequently cleared of any wrongdoing. According to Charity, her daughter had struggled with mental illness. Charity joined the Justice for All demonstration, which Jacksonville's civil rights leaders and community activists held to focus attention on the need for police amelioration. Charity said that the sheriff's office needs to change its training for officers and be held accountable for their actions. She further added that there should be an independent police accountability council to review sheriff's office shootings. Number 9. Stephanie Melgoza A video of an Illinois woman, Stephanie Melgoza, laughing carelessly just after her vehicle fatally mowed a couple in East Peoria circulated online and garnered millions of views. The incident took place on the night of April the 10th of 2022. The 23-year-old was driving her vehicle near North Main Street when she struck and killed 43-year-old Andrea Rosewitz and Paula Prowant, aged 55. Melgoza, who was uninjured, immediately called 911 after the crash. Upon the officer's arrival at the scene, the woman smiled and laughed at the officers, despite being informed of the tragedy. When she was questioned, she admitted to having consumed three vodkas before driving. Chilling body camera footage from one of the officers showed Melgoza giggling as she struggled to follow a police officer's instructions. Several field sobriety tests were given to her, but she failed all of them. An open handle of vodka and a small bag of marijuana were discovered in her vehicle along with a smoking pipe. A breathalyzer test result showed that her blood alcohol level was more than three times the legal limit for driving. Melgoza was taken to the OSF St. Francis Medical Center by officers. In the emergency room, Melgoza still appeared oblivious to the seriousness of the incident. The footage showed her discussing her upcoming trip to Las Vegas. She even began singing and dancing before asking an officer if she could get her car back in time to make it to class the next day. The officer replied, 
you killed two people tonight. I don't think you understand that. Ultimately, she was sentenced to 14 years in prison after pleading guilty to two counts each of aggravated DUI and aggravated reckless driving resulted in deaths. During her sentence hearing on April the 27th of 2023, she apologized in court and promised never to do it again. Number 8. Bree Ann Godori On May the 11th of 2023, a Florida woman was taken into custody after attempting to stab a sheriff's deputy with a tool used to fix flat tires. Officials from the Flagler County Sheriff's Office received a call about the female suspect riding a bicycle against traffic on East State Road 100, almost causing multiple crashes. The suspect, later identified as Bree Ann Godori, was also seen vandalizing vehicles by keying them. According to witnesses, a police body-worn camera captured a deputy, responded to the scene and then chasing after the 42-year-old. As he tried to take her into custody, she began shouting and cursing about TV producers. Apparently, she was angry because she believed that she was being recorded for TV. After she was sitting down on the ground, the officer asked her why she was resisting. Godori replied, because y'all are videoing me. She added that she'd already wanted it to stop for years. Moments later, Godori tried to stab the deputy with a sharp fixer flat tool. Backup arrived and as they tried to cuff her, the woman continued to resist arrest while repeatedly saying, more for TV, right? Eventually tased and successfully cuffed. In the aftermath, Godori was charged with aggravated battery on an officer, fleeing with the intent to elude police, resisting an officer with violence and two counts of criminal mischief. In the end, it was unclear what had caused her to act the way she did on the day in question. Records indicated that she was previously arrested for domestic violence and disorderly intoxication. Number 7. Christopher Michael Abbott On the morning of August the 18th of 2023, a man broke into a home in the 8400 block of Fifth Avenue in Seattle, Washington. Shortly after climbing through one of the home's windows, the intruder reportedly rummaged through the kitchen and ate some food while talking to himself. Local law enforcement rushed to the house after a man called about his teen daughter being alone at home and that she'd said that there was an intruder. Upon the officer's arrival, they heard a loud banging, which prompted them to force open the front door. They subsequently found the suspect, later identified as Christopher Michael Abbott, in the garage. The 40-year-old was sitting in the driver's seat of a sedan with a hammer in his lap and a gasoline canister in his hands. Police body camera footage showed the officers pointed a gun and instructed him to put his hands up, but instead he put the nozzle of the canister in his mouth and guzzled the gasoline. The officers asked Abbott to get out, but he refused to get out too. When the officers broke the window to get him out, he took a last chug of the gasoline. The officers wrestled the canister off him and hauled him out of the car. Police said that the man resisted, but was eventually taken into custody. The teen resident was found unharmed on the second floor of the home. In the end, Abbott was charged with residential burglary and held behind bars at the King County Jail on $20,000 bail. It never became clear what had prompted him to act strangely on that day. Number 6. Blake Tockman Police body-worn camera footage revealed the bizarre moment a naked Florida man covered in grease, peppermint oil and blood was arrested. In the early hours of April the 7th of 2023, 34-year-old Blake Tockman broke into an occupied home in DeBarry by smashing out some of its windows. The Volusia County Sheriff's deputies responded to the location after receiving reports of a burglary. When deputies arrived, they spotted Tockman naked in the backyard of another house he'd broken into. He immediately ran, jumped in a swimming pool, and then climbed out before leaping onto a trampoline. While he appeared to play dead, laying flat on the trampoline, deputies tried to put him under arrest, but he subsequently resisted. The suspect kicked three of the deputies, one of whom suffered a laceration to his arm. In the wild video, a deputy could be heard saying, He's slippery, as another noted that the man was covered in a paste 
as the owner of the home came out to possibly identify the alleged intruder, Tokman said, I'm a lifeguard, that's what I am. Apparently, he was under the influence of substances and covered in wheel beer in grease, peppermint oil and blood. It took four deputies to get him into custody and three paramedics to secure him to a stretcher. Tokman was given medical treatment before being taken to jail in the aftermath. He was charged with two counts of occupied burglary, three counts of battery on a law enforcement officer, two counts of criminal mischief, and resisting arrest with violence. Number 5. Sarah Befordin Police in La Crosse, Wisconsin received reports of a woman who'd stolen beer from a local grocery store called Quick Trip on July the 4th of 2021. A responding officer spotted the female suspect nearby, walking on the side of the road and carrying a case of Budweiser. The woman, later identified as Sarah Befordin, was confronted by the officer about the alleged theft. Initially, the 36 denied ever being at the store and simply continued walking. She was told by the officers to stop, but she was uncooperative. A second officer arrived and cornered Befordin, at which point she admitted that she'd been at the store but maintained that she didn't steal anything. The officers attempted to detain her, but she resisted and started getting belligerent. Officers attempted to remove the backpack Befordin was wearing, but she locked her arms and resisted some more. One of the officers' body cameras captured the woman getting increasingly combative. The video showed the officers having to take her to the floor and putting her in cuffs. Befordin was seen shouting at the officers, demanding they let her go. As she resisted, one officer sustained an abrasion to his forearm. The officers had to carry her so that they could put her in the squad car. In the end, Befordin was taken to the police station and charged with battery to a police officer, felony bail jumping, and resisting arrest causing injury. She was later released on a $1,000 signature bond. Number 4. Aaron Hong on July the 1st of 2019, an officer involved shooting that unfolded in Athens, Georgia, ended with the death of 23-year-old Aaron Hong. Senior Officer David Harrison and Officer Charles Biddinger had responded to the River Club apartments on Mason Highway to multiple reports about a man who was dripping blood and acting erratically. Police body cam video showed the two officers arriving to find a man holding a butcher knife and slowly advancing towards them. The officers repeatedly warned the man later identified as 23-year-old Aaron Hong to drop the knife. Instead, Hong started running toward Harrison, causing the latter to fire his weapon. The knife-wielding man got hit and dropped to the ground. As the officers commanded him to place his hands behind his back, Hong suddenly got up and lunged forward, grabbing hold of Harrison. In the video, the officer can be heard saying, He's going for my gun! The struggle caused Hong and Harrison to fall toward the pavement. Biddinger came to the rescue and fired his weapon multiple times. Striking Hong, responding paramedics treated Hong at the scene, but he succumbed to his injuries. Harrison sustained minor injuries and was also given medical treatment. In accordance with police department policy, Harrison and Biddinger were placed on administrative leave as the Georgia Bureau of Investigation looked into the shooting. After completing the investigation, the athens Clark County District Attorney's Office reviewed the case. In March of 2020, the office announced that Harrison and Biddinger were cleared in connection with the incident. The district attorney determined that the shots fired were justified and that there was no criminal wrongdoing on the part of the officers. Number 3. Joseph R. Sr. 64-year-old New Jersey man Joseph R. Sr. passed away 18 days after he was manhandled and pepper sprayed by officers from the Trenton Police Department on July the 6th of 2020. The officers responded to R's home on Monmouth Street at around 5.30 p.m. on the day in question. After R's son and namesake had called 911 about a domestic dispute with his baby's mother that did not involve his father, officers initially spoke to R's son, who'd answered the front door. A minute or two into the conversation, his father also joined. Not long after that, the discussion between the officers and the men turned from a conversation to an argument, one that escalated so quickly that it led one of the officers to unholster his service weapon while at the same time claiming that he'd be willing to shoot a dog in self-defense. 
The elder R replied and told the officer to put that gun away, man. The son retreated back into the house, but the father remained on the porch and continued to engage in the verbal dispute with the officers. Police body cam footage shows the officers eventually trying to detain R, but he pulled away. The officers subsequently grabbed the elderly man by the arm took him to the ground on his stomach and put him in handcuffs. During the encounter, Officer Nicholas Piotrowski struck R and pepper sprayed him directly in his face. R was heard gasping for air, saying he couldn't breathe. He later complained about his medical condition, prompting the officers to call emergency medical services. Responding paramedics treated him with oxygen and transported him to the Capital Health Regional Medical Center. R was admitted to the hospital but died there nearly three weeks later. A medical examiner determined that the victim had already been suffering from chronic pulmonary disease and COVID-19. After being pepper sprayed, he succumbed to acute respiratory failure. R's death was considered a homicide and was investigated by the Office of Public Integrity and Accountability. After being presented with the evidence from the investigation, a state grand jury voted to file a criminal charge against Officer Piotrowski. The latest updates indicated that in January of 2023, the AG's office announced that Piotrowski was indicted on one count of official misconduct. Number 2. George Theo Knowles III 32-year-old George Theo Knowles III from Miami, Florida, was arrested after he attacked a Miami-Dade police officer on June the 25th of 2023. Knowles had a long criminal history, which included trespassing, drug charges, battery, resisting an officer, and criminal mischief, among others. On the day in question, Knowles had been at the racetrack gas station on 216th Street, where he allegedly harassed customers by panhandling aggressively. When he was asked to leave the business, he refused, and at that moment, police were called. Responding officer Alexander Gattorno made contact with Knowles, who was sitting near the front entrance of the gas station's convenience store, and ordered him to remain seated as he waited for backup to arrive. The officer's body camera captured the man starting to become belligerent, asking why he needed to stay put. Gattorno grabbed his taser and ordered him to get on the ground. Knowles suddenly lunged toward the officer with a closed fist, causing the latter to deploy his taser twice. It appeared in the video that the suspect wasn't immobilized and was able to run. Gattorno gave chase and attempted to take him into custody. During the course of their ensuing pursuit, Gattorno was punched in the head repeatedly with both men eventually falling to the ground. Knowles was taken into custody after a second officer arrived. Gattorno was bleeding profusely after the incident and was taken to a hospital due to a broken nose and a large cut to the back of his head. In the aftermath, Knowles was charged with attempted murder, aggravated battery on an officer, resisting an officer with violence, and trespassing on a property after a warning. We are tagging on our previous release about when hip-hop stars go wrong right after number one for those of you who feel like they're only just starting to get warmed up. Number one, Julian Sebastian Kirko. At approximately 3.40 p.m. on March the 4th of 2022, law enforcement were called to a Walmart store in El Cajon, California. The store's loss prevention staff had reported a man who was attempting to steal sporting goods and threatening workers with an aluminium bat. A responding officer arrived at the location and spotted the man, later identified as Julian Sebastian Kirko, walking out the store's front doors carrying a bat. The officer approached the 26-year-old and asked him if they could just sit down and talk. Body camera footage showed that Julian was asked to drop the bat repeatedly before he surged forward, pulling the bat back and swinging it at the officer. A struggle broke out during which the officer attempted to restrain Julian. The latter was heard threatening the former, saying he'd kill him. As Julian made forceful efforts to extricate himself, he uttered, I want to kill you, bro. I really in do. When police backup arrived, Julian was taken into custody and booked into the San Diego Central Jail. His adoptive father, 
John Kirko told CBS 8 that Julian needed to take medication for bipolar disorder and possibly schizophrenia. John said that the defendant saw things and believed that the Illuminati were real. The father further stated that during the incident, Julian might have thought that the police were the Illuminati. On March the 14th, Julian pleaded not guilty to robbery, assault with a deadly weapon on a peace officer and attempted murder. He was ordered to undergo an evaluation in jail for psychiatric medication. Records indicated that the defendant was held without bond while awaiting trial. Number 16. Kevin Gates Louisiana rapper Kevin Gates, born Kevin Jerome Gilliard, was first arrested while in his early teens for being a passenger in a stolen car. Later on, he would speak on his consequent time in custody, saying, if they would have just pulled up to the jail, left me in the police car, never took me inside, and just took me back home, I don't think I'd ever have done anything else again. He noted that being incarcerated at a young age had actually criminalized him in a way as it took the fear of jail away. A few years after that incident, at around Christmas time in 2003, he got into an altercation outside a movie theater and repeatedly stabbed his opponent, which resulted in further jail time. In the 2010s, Gates rose to prominence with a series of mixtapes, three of which peaked in the top 40 on the Billboard 200 chart. The releases featured songs inspired by the hardships the rapper had faced, including street life and time behind bars. His delivery, which oscillated between melodic and aggressive along with his autobiographical honesty, would become the staples of his style. Gates released his debut studio album entitled Isla, named after his first-born daughter in late January of 2016. It peaked at number two on the Billboard chart and featured the triple platinum song Really Really and the quadruple platinum Two Phones. Around the same time, Gates once again found himself in legal trouble. A video showed him kicking an 18-year-old female fan in the chest while performing at an event in Lakeland, Florida. In the summer of 2015, he tried to use Florida's Stand Your Ground law as a defense, claiming the fan had pulled on his clothes but was convicted of battery in the fall of 2016 and sentenced to 180 days in jail. During his incarceration, a warrant was reissued based on a 2013 arrest in Illinois. At the time, Gates, a convicted felon, had been found with a firearm around a dangerous controlled substance. He never showed up in court. The charges caught up with him and he was sentenced to 30 months in prison while he was at the height of his career. He was paroled in early 2018 promptly returned to making music and continued to achieve commercial and critical success. Number 15. Chopper A rapper and former reality star was arrested on April the 25th of 2022 after he'd been charged by the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department in connection to running an escort service. 37-year-old Kevin Barnes, who rapped as Chopper, had appeared on the early 2000s MTV reality series, Making the Band. In the show's wake, Barnes had become a member of the hip-hop group The Band, formed by Sean P. Diddy Combs. Leading up to his arrest, he was suspected of using his large social media following in order to recruit women as escorts. Las Vegas law enforcement set up a fake Instagram profile and started communicating with the rapper online, with the discussion revealing details about his operation. Barnes believed he was talking to a woman who was trying to leave Las Vegas due to the fact that she'd been arrested for working as an escort in the past and the city had become too scrutinized by law enforcement for her to continue the trade. During the conversation, Barnes boasted about owning multiple houses and referred to himself as a boss. He asked the woman to meet him in Charlotte, North Carolina and become part of his stable, a term referring to the group of women already involved in his operation when the prospective escort showed Hesitancy, the rapper started threatening her, saying, I know how to find you and I can make it bad for you. The exchange provided investigators with sufficient evidence to arrest Barnes on trafficking charges. Number 14. Bobby Schmurder New York rapper Aquil Jean Pollard gained mainstream attention under the name Bobby Schmurder in the spring of 2014. In the video of his breakout song, which was edited for radio as Hot Boy, Pollard performed his signature Schmoney dance, which became a meme, particularly among Vine users. The dance was replicated by several hip-hop stars, including Jay-Z and Drake. Pollard's song went viral 
and was ultimately certified platinum, while the video as of March of 2023 had over 847 million views on YouTube. Pollard, who has since been regarded as a pioneer of the Brooklyn drill subgenre, was signed to Epic Records. The 20-year-old was set to become one of hip-hop's most prominent stars, but in June of 2014, he was arrested and charged with felony gun possession after the police had spotted him flashing a pistol in an apartment. Pollard was released on bail and continued to build on the success of his breakout hit with a remix featuring household names in hip-hop like Jadakiss, Busta Rhymes and Chris Brown. Pollard released his debut EP, Schmurder She Wrote, on November 10th of 2014. A little over a month later, Pollard was arrested along with 14 members of his GS9 gang, including his brother Gervais and his epic record label mate Rowdy Rebel. The NYPD had been investigating GS9, short for Grimy Shooters or G-Stone Crips, for over a year before Pollard had come into the spotlight. The crew faced dozens of charges that included conspiracy, murder, attempted murder, assault, reckless endangerment, drugs and weapons possession. Pollard was identified as the driving force behind a group that, among others, was accused of indiscriminately firing their weapons in public places and getting into deadly battles with their gangland rivals. The NYPD claimed that Pollard's songs and videos were actually a chronicle of the group's criminal activity, and Pollard himself stated during multiple media appearances that his lyrics were based on real-life events. Over the course of less than a year, Bobby Schmurder had become a viral sensation, bound for superstardom, then faced a maximum of 8 to 25 years in prison. He initially pleaded not guilty to all charges, as did all of the GS9 members arrested alongside him. He remained in custody on a $2 million bail. While imprisoned at Rikers Island and awaiting trial, Pollard was involved in several fights, including one in May of 2015 between members of the Bloods and the Crips. In the summer of that same year, Pollard's girlfriend Kimberly Rousseau was caught trying to pass him a makeshift knife during visitation. Pollard was eventually sentenced to seven years in prison after accepting a deal from the prosecution in which he pleaded guilty to one count of third-degree conspiracy and one count of weapons possession. He and Russo also pleaded guilty to promoting prison contraband in 2017, and the rapper was given a four-year sentence to run concurrently with the one he was already serving. Number 13. Dight 23 Welsh rapper Dight 23 was arrested for causing criminal damage to a children's skate park and soccer pitch in Ebu Vale, Coom, while filming a music video. The incident took place on February the 5th of 2023 after the local rapper had reportedly put out a call on social media for those with dirt bikes, quad bikes and other vehicles to join him during shooting. Footage subsequently captured by witnesses would show dozens riding across the wet grass, tearing up the field which was rented from the local council and maintained by volunteers. Alex Price from the local soccer team, RTB Ebu Vale Jr. FC, condemned the rapper's action, stating that he and his posse had completely ruined the whole area, which was primarily used by local children. Upcoming football matches consequently had to be rescheduled while the pitch was re-turfed. Price also mentioned that most of the team's income came from selling tea or coffee during home games, meaning that rescheduling would affect that aspect as well. Dyke reported that he was made to look the villain while insisting that the damage had already been done by the time he'd arrived at the scene with his photographer. He acknowledged that the riders were there for him but maintained that they all got their own brains and expressed disappointment towards their actions. He offered to donate a few hundred pounds towards mending the damage. The Ebu Vale rapper was arrested on suspicion of conspiring to intentionally or recklessly cause a public nuisance. Number 12. Foxy Brown Born Inga De Carlo, Fung Marchand, rapper Foxy Brown had a meteoric rise to fame in the mid-1990s. With her debut album, Il Nana, she was widely praised for her distinctive voice, stage presence and raunchy lyrics, with her music described as intriguingly seductive. Brown quickly became one of the most sought-after female rappers in the industry, collaborating with artists like Jay-Z, Nas, and Method Man. Her 1999 album China Doll debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 album chart, making Brown the second female rapper to have done so after Lauryn Hill. Brown's success and significant contribution to hip-hop would be somewhat overshadowed by her legal troubles. Over the years, she was arrested several times, most notably for assault and menacing. 
In 2002, she was detained in Jamaica for an altercation with a policewoman at the airport and fled without making a court appearance. Two years later, she attacked two manicurists at a New York City nail salon following a dispute over a $20 bill. She was sentenced to three years of probation and also involved attending anger management classes. Brown violated the terms of her parole and was sentenced to one year in prison in September of 2007. Only a month later, during her incarceration, she was sent to solitary confinement for 74 days after she'd gotten into an altercation with another inmate. A few years after her release, Brown was arrested in Brooklyn and charged with felony criminal contempt for violating a restraining order against her neighbor, 25-year-old Arlene Raymond. Back in 2007, the rapper had thrown her blackberry at the latter, which prompted the victim to seek and ultimately be granted a restraining order against her. In the summer of 2010, Brown allegedly swore at Raymond and mooned her. She faced up to seven years in prison for the violation, but the charges were eventually dropped. Number 11, NLE Chopper. NLE Chopper, a rising hip-hop star from Memphis, Tennessee, was arrested in March of 2021 on multiple charges, including burglary, drug, and gun possession. The arrest came after an incident in Broward County, Florida, where the rapper Bryson LaShawn Potts by his real name and two associates were caught breaking into a tow yard. According to police reports, the masked men had jumped a fence at the Superior Towing Company in Davie while attempting to retrieve a vehicle that had been impounded during the arrest. Officers discovered a Glock 27 handgun with an extended magazine, an AK-47 Draco pistol, marijuana, and Xanax pills in the group's possession. Potts was charged with burglary of an unoccupied structure, carrying a concealed firearm, possession of Xanax, possession of marijuana under 20 grams, and possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony. He was later released on bond. In spite of previously admitting that the bag containing the drugs was his, Potts later accused the police of setting him up and affirmed his confidence in beating the case. The arrest occurred at a time when the 18-year-old rapper was gaining increased attention for his music. He'd risen into the mainstream spotlight with his 2019 song, Shutter Flow, which showcased his energetic rapping and aggressive tones. In the song's video, he was spotted holding a Draco, possibly the same model found on him at the tow yard. The single went platinum, and in August of 2020, he released his debut studio album, Top Shotter, which peaked at number 10 on the Billboard 200 chart. A little over a month after his Florida arrest, Potts and several associates were involved in a fight on a beach in Santa Monica, California. A video of the altercation started circulating in the spring of 2021 and it quickly went viral. Potts and his entourage had gotten into an argument with two men on electric bikes, who were reportedly fans of his music. The rapper charged one of them, and his crew followed suit, relentlessly pummeling the man even after he'd fallen in the sand. Bystanders had remarked on the altercation's disparity, since Potts and his crew outnumbered the victim. When the video surfaced on Twitter, the rapper was criticized for the attack, with one user calling him fake woke for always talking about meditating and then starting fights. Other users poked fun at the rapper for getting punched in the face by the victim as soon as he'd rushed him. Potts replied to the criticism by claiming, I eat punches, and then stated, the fight had started because the man had insulted him and he'd refused to take a photo. It wasn't made immediately clear if the rapper faced charges for the altercation. Number 10. Remy Ma Born Reminis Smith is an American rapper from New York City who rose to prominence in the early 2000s after she was discovered and mentored by Bronx rapper Big Pun. She gained widespread recognition through her collaborations with the latter as well as with Fat Joe after joining his hip-hop group, Terror Squad. Smith's solo debut album, There's Something About Remy, based on a true story, was released in 2006 and earned critical acclaim. Throughout her career, Smith was nominated for four Grammy Awards and was a two-time recipient of the BET Award for Best Female Hip-Hop Artist. Shortly after experiencing success with her debut album, Smith was involved in a shooting outside a delicatessen in Manhattan in July of 2007. The incident resulted in her former friend, Makeda Barnes-Joseph, sustaining serious gunshot wounds. 
Police sources indicated that the latter had identified Smith as a shooter. The hip-hop star had accused Barnes Joseph of stealing $3,000 from her and after the shooting reportedly displayed complete disregard for her condition. As Barnes Joseph was seriously wounded in a car, Smith went through her purse looking for the alleged stolen money, which was never found. The bleeding victim was abandoned in the front seat while Smith entered another vehicle and fled the scene. She surrendered to the police on July the 13th and was charged with assault, weapon possession and attempted murder. She was also charged with gang assault and witness tampering. After an incident in August of 2007 in which several of her male friends had allegedly attacked a witness's boyfriend, Smith was eventually acquitted of the latter charges but in March of 2008, she was convicted of assault and illegal weapon possession for which she was sentenced to eight years in prison. Barnes Joseph underwent multiple surgeries in the shooting's aftermath and filed an $80 million lawsuit against Smith. During her incarceration, Smith married fellow New York City rapper Papoose. Shortly after Smith's release in 2014, the couple joined the cast of Love & Hip Hop New York. In the spring of 2019, Smith was investigated by the NYPD for allegedly assaulting Brittany Taylor, one of her co-stars on the show. She turned herself in to the authorities, but the charges were eventually dropped due to a lack of evidence. Aside from her legal troubles, Smith also feuded with other female rappers, most notably Nicki Minaj and Foxy Brown. There were even reports that she'd punched the latter in January of 2005 while at the Island Def Jam Universal offices. Number 9. City Girls Jatavia J.T. Johnson and her partner, Koresha Young Miami Brownlee, rose to stardom as City Girls and with a debut diss track aimed at their ex-boyfriends. The Florida duo promoted the song, which used a sample from Kaya's hit record, My Neck, My Back, through social media and by paying DJs to play it in clubs. Just as it started receiving wider attention and right before City Girl signed a deal with record label Quality Control, Johnson was arrested and charged with aggravated identity theft for running a credit card scam. She was sentenced to two years in a federal prison, but a judge granted her a pushback on her surrender date. Johnson, at the time in her mid-twenties, turned herself into the authorities in late June of 2018. The following month, the duo was launched into mainstream recognition with an uncredited appearance on Drake's massive hit, In My Feelings, which broke several records and topped the Billboard chart for 10 weeks. Drake even referenced Resha and JT in the song's chorus. Brownlee, who continued promoting the duo's music, appeared in the music video wearing free JT clothing. Johnson was still in custody when the duo's debut album, Girl Code, came out and peaked at 63 on Billboard. She was officially released from federal custody in March of 2020, and the duo released several other projects. Brownlee also found herself embroiled in controversy and sparked outrage from the LGBTQ community after claiming that she'd beat her son if she found out he was gay. She tweeted out the statement in 2013 and apologized on social media when it resurfaced. However, when given the chance to clarify the matter on The Breakfast Club radio show, she stood by her comment of not wanting a gay son. Number 8. Lachlan Belmore Australian rapper Lachlan Belmore was arrested for murder, home invasion and drug offenses. In October of 2022, the hip-hop artist, who performed as Drips, was accused of storming a home located about 20 miles north of Melbourne's CBD in Cal Calo. 24-year-old Belmore allegedly used a rifle to gun down 22-year-old Griffin Harris on September the 21st. Emergency services were called to the home shortly after 4.15 a.m. and pronounced the victim dead at the scene. Belmore wasn't alone in what the police believed had been a targeted attack. Law enforcement arrested five other people in connection to Harris's death. Their homes were raided and several of their possessions were seized for further investigation, including phones, laptops, and vehicles. Among the others that were arrested was 31-year-old Wallen man Dean Bell, a father of two, who was also charged with murder and home invasion. Belmore was arrested on the same charges in addition to being accused of kidnapping and drug trafficking. The rapper was seemingly unaffected by Harris's violent murder as roughly 48 hours in its wake, he teased the release of a new music video. He and the others were expected to be back in court in February of 2023. Number 7. 
Tommy Lee. 34-year-old Atasha Chizar Jefferson, better known as Tommy Lee, was arrested twice over the course of 24 hours in October of 2018. An indictment revealed that the love and hip-hop Atlanta star had caused a violent scene at her daughter's school in Cobb County, Georgia. Jefferson reportedly slapped her daughter with the straps of her handbag and cursed her out in front of classmates before dragging her down the school's hall by her hair. She then threw her daughter head first into a metal locker. Jefferson was arrested on charges that included battery and aggravated assault. The court barred her from contacting the victim, but Jefferson violated that order roughly three hours after her release from jail and was arrested once more for aggravated stalking and obstruction of an officer a few days later. Jefferson revealed in a social media post that she wouldn't be returning to the VH1 reality show on which she'd been making appearances since 2016. Prior to becoming a reality star, Jefferson had had over two dozen run-ins with the law. By her own admission on the show, she'd been taken into custody nearly 30 times, with the vast majority of the incidents consisting of parole violations. For the latest offenses, Jefferson faced a sentence of up to 54 years. Number 6. Curtis Jackson New York City rapper Curtis Jackson, who achieved Worldwide recognition as 50 Cent began selling illegal substances in his preteens at a time when he was living in Queens with his grandparents. He would reportedly take drug money and weapons with him to school and he was eventually caught by a metal detector while he was a sophomore at Andrew Jackson High School. Jackson openly told his grandparents that he was a drug dealer after his arrest. He was taken into custody again in 1994 after he'd sold four vials of cocaine to an undercover police officer. Less than a month later, he was arrested once more and his home was raided, whereupon law enforcement found heroin and several ounces of crack cocaine. Jackson was handed a prison sentence of three to nine years, but was released after completing six months in a boot camp. He started rapping in a friend's basement and perfected the craft after meeting and being mentored by Jam Master J of Run DMC in the mid-1990s. He adopted the stage name 50 Cent, which was the nickname of a Brooklyn robber from the 1980s. He described it as a metaphor for change. Jackson's rise to prominence on New York's underground hip-hop scene was through the single How to Rob, in which he humorously rapped how he'd go about stealing from established names in the industry. It earned considerable attention and Jackson was slated for several high-profile collaborations just as he was making a name for himself. Jackson was ambushed and shot multiple times as the result of an alleged drug dispute. On May the 24th of 2000, he and a friend sat inside of a car outside the home of Jackson's grandmother in South Jamaica, Queens. Another vehicle pulled up close to theirs and a gunman emerged. He repeatedly fired on Jackson with a 9mm pistol while at close range. The rapper suffered nine gunshot injuries including to both of his legs, chest and cheek. The facial wounds resulted in a bullet fragment becoming permanently embedded in his tongue, giving him a slight slur. His alleged shooter, Daryl Baum, a friend and bodyguard to boxing legend Mike Tyson, was shot and killed three weeks after the attack on Jackson. The rapper fully recovered in just five months, resumed making music and grew in popularity by releasing a series of mixtapes. One of them eventually attracted the attention of fellow rapper Eminem, who was at the time arguably the biggest name in the hip-hop industry. Jackson worked with him and producer Dr. Dre to release his highly anticipated debut album, Get Rich or Die Try It. It was a massive success that became the best-selling album of 2003 in the US, went platinum nine times and catapulted 50 Cent to superstardom. The rapper referenced the shooting and the fate of his gunman in one of the songs on the album entitled Many Men, with one line saying, he got hit like I got hit, but he ain't breathing. Jackson interpreted surviving the shooting as an indication that he had a higher purpose in music rather than crime. Nevertheless, he would experience more legal troubles that paralleled his growing fame. One such incident occurred on May the 10th of 2004, when Jackson made a surprise appearance at the Hippodrome nightclub in Springfield, Massachusetts. 
while performing, the rapper was hit in the head with a water bottle. Jackson took off his chain before jumping into the crowd and was followed into the ensuing melee by his bodyguards. Two women accused the rapper of trampling them and another claimed he'd punched her in the face. Jackson was charged with three counts of assault and battery. He was ultimately given two years probation with several conditions that included staying off drugs and being randomly tested, attending anger management counseling and producing an educational anti-violence public service announcement. Number 5. Christopher Prince Michael Harty Christopher Prince Michael Harty, a former star on the VH1 reality TV show Love & Hip Hop Miami, was arrested in August of 2021 on charges of domestic violence and kidnapping. The arrest took place at approximately 2 p.m. local time in Miami. According to a police report, 31-year-old Harty had become aggressive during an argument with his girlfriend and physically assaulted her. The unnamed woman had gone to his apartment in Brickle to return his shoes. She allegedly threw them at Harty after the row had erupted. The hip-hop star retaliated by slamming her to the ground, choking her and punching her in the mouth. The victim also alleged that Harty dragged her by the hair and held her against her will. She sustained multiple injuries, including bruises and scratches to her lip, neck, chest, arms, and legs during the attack. She was eventually able to break away and reach an elevator. Harty was taken into custody by the Miami-Dade police and charged with domestic battery by strangulation, false imprisonment, and kidnapping. He additionally faced the lesser charges of disorderly conduct and possession of a controlled substance without a prescription. Harty was held at the Turner Guilford Knight Correctional Center in Miami before being granted a $25,000 bond. Footage from his court appearance on August the 12th made its way to the internet and showed him as he broke down in tears during the hearing. At the time of his arrest, Harty was due to attend a press conference promoting an upcoming boxing match against TikTok star Holly God. Harty rose to fame as a founding member on the cast of Love & Hip Hop Miami. When the series premiered in 2018, he displayed a party boy persona on the reality show and he became known as the Prince of South Beach. But he was eventually let go by the show's producers after two seasons. Number 4. Tory Lanez Tory Lanez, born Daystar Peterson, is a Canadian rapper, singer and songwriter who first gained recognition for his mixed tapes and collaborations with major artists such as Meek Mill, Justin Bieber and Sean Paul. His debut studio album, I Told You, was released in 2016 and included hits like Say It and Love. Peterson's fourth studio album, Chicks Tape 5, peaked at number two on the US Billboard 200. The hip-hop star's blossoming career took a dramatic turn following the events of July the 12th of 2020. On that date, fellow rapper Megan Thee Stallion, Megan Javon Ruth Pete by her real name, sustained injuries to her feet following an argument at a party in the Hollywood Hills. Pete, Peterson and another unidentified woman were in the same car when it was pulled over by local law enforcement. Peterson was arrested for carrying a concealed firearm, while Pete's wounds were at the time reported to have been caused by broken glass. Later in July, in a tearful Instagram live session, she revealed that she'd been shot in both feet, although she didn't say who the person responsible was. Pete ultimately named Peterson as her shooter in another live session the following month, stating, I didn't tell the police what happened immediately right there because I didn't want to die. The shooting sparked a media frenzy as each party and their representatives accused the other of lying about what had happened. Despite the allegations, Peterson maintained his innocence and released an album titled Daystar in the fall of 2020 in which he addressed the shooting in nearly every song. He claimed that Pete and her team were trying to frame him. On the song Money Over Fallouts, Peterson rapped, How you get shot in your foot, don't hit no bones or tendons. However, the album received a fair degree of backlash from fans and the music industry, with some accusing Peterson of exploiting the incident for publicity and launching a smear campaign against Pete. The rapper's streaming numbers dropped significantly, and a number of artists ceased working with him. A month after the release of his album in October of 2020, Peterson was officially charged with one felony count each of assault with a semi-automatic firearm, personal use of a firearm, and carrying a loaded, unregistered firearm in a vehicle. Pete spoke about the incident in an op-ed for the New York Times in which she noted, Black women are still constantly disrespected and disregarded in so many areas of life. 
Pete recounted that she was shot twice by a man with whom she wasn't involved in a relationship and from whom she'd been trying to walk away. She was granted a protection order that directed Peterson to cease all contact with her and stay at least 100 yards from her at all times. On December the 13th of 2022, Pete testified against him at his assault trial, telling the court that the incident had left her so distraught that she wished she died. Ten days later, Peterson was convicted of assault with a semi-automatic handgun, having a loaded and unregistered firearm in a vehicle and gross negligence in discharging his firearm. He faced up to 22 years and eight months in prison, and as of the latest updates on the case, his sentencing was delayed until April the 10th of 2023. Number 3. Kanye West Ye, born Kanye or Mari West, is among the best-known names in hip-hop ever since the launch of his debut album, The College Dropout. In the mid-2000s, he's developed into one of the most influential figures in the culture and beyond. He amassed continuous critical praise and commercial success as a rapper and producer, earning 22 Grammy Awards and 75 nominations, in addition to a multitude of other accolades. West is also among the few names in hip-hop to have become a billionaire through his business ventures, particularly his Yeezy sneaker brand. While widely celebrated for his artistic contributions and innovations, West is also among the most controversial hip-hop stars, his behavior on social media and at award shows, along with his views on matters such as politics, race or slavery, have been the subject of outrage in some circles and true speculation regarding his mental health. He was diagnosed with bipolar disorder in 2016, but went back and forth on accepting the diagnosis publicly in the years that followed. One notable incident that drew considerable media attention occurred at the 2009 MTV Music Video Awards when West walked out on stage as Taylor Swift was accepting her award for Best Female Video. He took the microphone from Swift and proclaimed that Beyonce should have won instead. The move drew criticism from others in the music industry and beyond, with President Barack Obama calling West a jackass for the move. A few years later, in 2013, West attacked paparazzo Daniel Ramos. The latter had been waiting for West outside Los Angeles International Airport. As later reported by Ramos's lawyer, the photographer had shouted at the hip-hop star, Kanye, why can't we talk to you? At which point, West tried to wrestle his camera away from him. Ramos fell and injured his hip in the struggle. West was sentenced to serve two years probation in 2014 after he was convicted of misdemeanor battery. He was also ordered to attend 24 anger management sessions, perform 250 hours of community service, and pay restitution to Ramos. West settled a civil lawsuit with the latter in 2015, just a week before it was about to go to the trial. Some of West's Controversial statements include saying that abortion is genocide and population control of black people and that slavery sounds like a choice. He subsequently apologized for the latter, claiming that he was advocating for freedom of expression and thought as a means of escaping mental enslavement. In 2022, West collaborations and partnerships with several high-profile brands including Adidas, Balenciaga and Gap were terminated after he'd made a series of anti-Semitic statements on social media. One of them was that he was going to go death con three on Jewish people, while also claiming that they were controlling his music and businesses. He was banned from all social media following the remarks, which he defended by claiming that he couldn't be anti-Semitic because black people are actually Jew. West drew further condemnation as in a subsequent interview, he stated that he loved Jewish people, but that he also liked Nazis and could see good things about Hitler. Number 2. Maurice Fain In the fall of 2021, Georgia man Maurice Fain was sentenced to 17 years in prison for his involvement in a Ponzi scheme and a fraud case. The latter saw him illegally obtain over $2 million in government-backed loans meant to assist small businesses during the COVID-19 pandemic. Fain had appeared on season 8 of VH1's Love & Hip Hop Atlanta as the love interest of longtime cast member Carly Red. Also known as Arkansas Mo, he was arrested in May of 2020 and charged with bank fraud after he allegedly used the Paycheck Protection Program PPP, to purchase a Rolex watch, a Rolls Royce, custom-made diamond jewelry and other luxury items. He also diverted about $40,000 of the taxpayer money towards paying child support fees. The PPP was established as part of the CARES Act 
to provide financial assistance to small businesses affected by the pandemic. According to court documents, Fain submitted false loan applications on behalf of his towing company, Flame Trucking, claiming that it had 107 employees and stated an intention to use the money to maintain a $1.4 million monthly payroll and to make various payments. Using the PPP as a cover, Fain further fueled a pre-existing multi-state Ponzi scheme through which he defrauded more than 20 investors into his business between March of 2013 and May of 2020. Fain used the funds to cover personal debts and back his lavish lifestyle, at one point allegedly spending more than $5 million at a casino in Oklahoma. In addition to the prison sentence, Fain was ordered to pay restitution of over $4 million and serve three years of supervised release. During sentencing, prosecutors noted that he had taken advantage of a program that was meant to help struggling businesses during a time of crisis. That sentiment was echoed by Chris Hacker, special agent in charge of FBI Atlanta, who told the media, we won't tolerate anyone driven by personal greed to pocket American taxpayer money. Number 1. Takashi 69 American rapper Daniel Hernandez, better known as Takashi 69, achieved worldwide fame in late 2017 through his debut single, Gummo. Hernandez, then in his early 20s, instantly attracted attention through his aggressive style of rapping as well as his distinctive rainbow-colored hair, rainbow-plated grills, and his facial tattoos most notably the number 69 on his forehead. His platinum-certified debut album, Dummy Boy, peaked at number two on the Billboard 200 and featured the hit Fifi with Nicki Minaj and Murder Beats. Hernandez's rise to prominence was marked by a number of serious legal problems. Even before he'd gained mainstream attention in 2015, he was arrested for having inappropriate contact with a teenager, filming the encounter, and then using the footage as part of a music video. He faced several years in prison and being forced to register as an offender but was ultimately given four years probation. By his own admission, Hernandez was a member of the Nine Trey Gangsters, a subdivision of the United Bloods Nation Street Gang. He feuded with several other hip-hop stars including Trippy Red and Chief Keef. In early June of 2018, the latter was fired upon while outside the W Hotel in New York City, but was not hit. Hernandez would later admit that he'd paid his associate, Kinti Kuda B. McKenzie, 20,000, to shoot Chief Keefe. On July the 22nd of 2018, Hernandez had just finished filming the video for Fifi and was outside his Brooklyn home when he was kidnapped by three armed assailants. A pistol whipped the rapper and threw him in a car. The attackers took $35,000 in cash and $750,000 worth of jewelry from him. But Hernandez was able to escape the vehicle, found help, and was taken to a hospital where he recovered. His kidnappers would be identified as his fellow Nine Trey gangsters. In November of that same year, Hernandez and several of his criminal associates were arrested. The rapper was charged with Federal Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act as well as other charges that included armed robbery, firearms charges, and conspiracy to commit murder. Hernandez initially pleaded not guilty with his lawyer claiming that he was an innocent entertainer, portraying a gangster image to promote his music. He eventually pleaded guilty to nine charges in early February of 2019 and faced 47 years behind bars, but then struck a deal with the prosecution. Hernandez agreed to offer information on the nine Trey gangsters and testify against them. As part of the agreement, he wouldn't be prosecuted for any of his charges. Hernandez's testimony led to the conviction of several gang members. One of them was Anthony Harve Ellison, who'd reportedly orchestrated the rapper's kidnapping, and Kinti McKenzie, whom Hernandez had contracted to shoot Chief Keefe. As part of the cooperation agreement, Hernandez also admitted being responsible for domestic violence from 2011 to 2018. No victims were mentioned in court, but the timeline corresponded to allegations of abuse from his ex-girlfriend and mother of his daughter, Sarah Molina. She reported that Hernandez had abused and severely beaten her on multiple occasions throughout their relationship. For all his crimes, Hernandez was ultimately only given a two-year sentence with credit for time served and he was released to home confinement in the spring of 2020. The rapper's decision to collaborate with the authorities had led to concerns of attempts on his life, as doing so had been in violation of the street code. Hernandez nevertheless returned to music and released the defiant single Gooba with a music video in May of 2020, which went viral 
and amassed hundreds of millions of views on YouTube alone. One line of the song was seemingly aimed at those criticize him for cooperating with law enforcement with Hernandez rapping, tell me how I ratted, came home to a big bag. Thanks for watching. Would you rather fight a K9 or a washed up K1 fighter? Let us know in the comments section below.